Can I please have all the members of the audience take their seats? Okay. Thank you. I hope you all enjoyed your lunch and are re-energized to keep on going through the afternoon. I would just like to begin by introducing our chairman, Mr. Anthony Teo. Mr. Anthony Teo, besides being a wonderful MEI board member, <clears throat> was the secretary to the University of Nanyang Technological University here in Singapore, and concurrently an ex-official member of the Senate and a member of the university cabinet until 2010. Presently, he is advisor on special projects to the president. He is a member of the management board of the Middle East Institute. And in 2010, he was awarded the Chevalier of the French Order of the Palme Académique. And in 2009, visiting fellow at Wolfson College, Cambridge University, from which he just returned about one week ago. Mr. Tio is a member of the Academic Committee for the QS University Rankings and the inaugural QS Maple Middle East and Africa Professional Leaders in Education Conference on Globalizing Higher Education in the Middle East and Africa. His banking and business interests engaged him in Saudi Arabia with Singapore contractors, in Bahrain with Gulf International Bank, BSC, and financings with major Asian contracting corporations Dailam in Kuwait and others. He was the vice chairman of the Singapore Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong and editor-in-chief of SCC News and publisher of Asian Business. He received his MBA from Harvard University and was co-founder of the Harvard Singapore Foundation. And it's my pleasure to hand it over to him. Oh, thank you, Rana. Uh, it's always difficult to compete after lunch. So we'll try to make it interesting. And <clears throat> this afternoon, what I'll do is, <clears throat> I've been instructed by Rana that every speaker will have 15 minutes. So what we'll do is, each speaker will speak for 15 minutes, and then collectively at the end, then we'll get into the question and answer. So the first speaker we have, all of us have the CVs and programs, so I'm going to introduce in very short summary form. The first speaker is Dr. Stephen Hertog. Uh, he is Professor of Comparative Politics at the London School of Economics. And he's going to speak on the issue of rentier states without rentiers redesigning the distributional bargain in the Gulf. Thank you very much. Uh, one question up front, there should be a PowerPoint uh, from me. Could, could we get that on screen? Because otherwise I will not remember what, was, uh, what I meant to say. Um, I think it's the only purpose of PowerPoints to actually remind the speaker of. Uh, excellent. So I'll just step up to the podium. Um, so th thanks very much for braving the, the after lunch fatigue. Um, if I wasn't speaking, I'm not sure I'd be here. Um, I've uh, got the coveted spot of the first uh, after lunch speaker, so uh, I'll try to keep it as crisp and as interesting as possible. I've been told in no uncertain terms to keep it to 15 minutes. Um, but first of all, I'd, I'd really like to thank uh, the MEI and, and the NUS more broadly for, for bringing me back for what, what is my second visit in Singapore, and the, the last one. Uh, uh, quite contrary to what what we heard over lunch, uh, was two two years ago. I was actually very impressed with the, with the budding expertise and the way that the, the country, both on the government side and on the uh, policy making uh, and and university academic side, has built up quite impressive expertise in in a, a very short period about uh, about the Middle East. Um, and I had very interesting conversations back then. At the time, 2008, it was the time of the economic crisis, so uh, what, I, what I said had some current relevance and, and, uh, and I had a, a very grateful audience. This time is all more about politics, so it's, it's a bit more of an uphill struggle to, to keep you awake after lunch uh, with uh, a topic that's more economics oriented, but I'll actually make a case that uh, in particular when it comes to the GCC countries, to the Gulf monarchies, actually understanding the economics and in particular the uh, fiscal policy aspects of how those regimes have reacted to the crisis is very, very important in understanding uh, 
uh, <coughs> their role in uh, the broader wave of revolutionary movements in, in the region, and also the prospects for uh, future stability, political and socioeconomic of, of those regimes. So I'll, I'll make that plea. I've got this uh, remote control here. It's uh, 25 slides, so I've already probably wasted about five minutes. So it'll be about uh, 20 to 25 uh, crisp seconds per slide. Um, so what's been happening recently uh, in the GCC uh, all across uh, the six countries in terms of the policy response to the regional crisis is that apart from you know, some measures of policing and repression, very consistently all of the regimes have engaged in, in old school politics of patronage, uh, creating new jobs, making certain public services available for free, lowering prices, uh, creating all kinds of new welfare payments. And I, I don't think I'll walk through all those details. I mean, if anyone's interested, I think we can send around the PowerPoint uh, after the panel. Um, but <clears throat> the basic point is that they've reacted in a way that they've reacted to previous crises, for example, in Saudi Arabia, to uh, the occupation of the Grand Mosque in 1979, which was uh, responded to through uh, stepped up state employment, stepped up subsidy programs, uh, uh, more patronage over the religious sector, which was, which was used to uh, try to control uh, radical religious fringe groups. And now we've got a lot of the same happening again. A lot of new, uh, arguably unneeded public sector jobs being created for young nationals, the kind of um, disenfranchised, uh, uh, economically frustrated youth that now every Arab autocrat is very afraid of. Um, all kinds of other welfare payments, uh, among other things relating to free utility, public services, water, electricity, health, education, and so on and so forth, and all kinds of other subsidiary um, welfare payments of various kinds. Um, and this deepens already uh, existing very vast and expansive distributional structures which have really kept together the GCC political economies over the last few decades. Uh, but we've reached a point in the economic history of the GCC where the kind of unintended effects and, and the, the perverse economic consequences, uh, the, the, the perverse incentives created by distribution as it is organized currently in the GCC political economies uh, have, uh, have uh, political uh, side effects that uh, could actually uh, endanger the, the fiscal as well as the socioeconomic stability of the GCC in the long run and uh, to the extent that they've kicked the problem down the road uh, through those new policies of patronage. They've arguably made it worse in the long run and I'll, I'll try to explain what I mean by that. And I try to make the broader argument that obviously those are distribution and rent-based systems as far as the politics is concerned, but the way that distribution is organized is uh, in many ways self-defeating and uh, in many ways creates uh, incentive structures that, that prevent the Gulf from moving into a, a post rentier and more diversified uh, age that could in the long run create the kind of employment and socioeconomic stability that those uh, regimes, be they autocratic or democratic or somewhere in between, uh, will need to seek in the, in the, in the coming decades. Um, well, that's just one measure of uh, patronage, uh, patronage spending in the GCC countries. It's, it's a graph where you've got uh, government spending on wages and salaries as a percentage of GDP, and then the, the same thing as a percentage of state spending, where you see that, uh, by and large, those countries score pretty high in international comparison, and uh, those that actually score lower arguably it's called lower because a lot of state employment is hidden because it's in the security services, it's in parts of the state that don't show up in the, uh, in the national accounts that are published. But certainly if you look at Saudi Arabia, it spends a larger share of its budget, or it did in 2008, uh, spend a larger share of its budget on salaries than almost any other state in the world. And a lot of those jobs are unneeded. There's a lot of overstaffing in the Saudi public sector. The unofficial number of Saudi uh, public employment is about around 3 million people. Uh, the official number is 900,000, but uh, that, that there's a huge unaccounted for employment uh, in, in the religious and the, the security sectors. And with the recent crisis and the kind of knee-jerk reaction of throwing yet more jobs at young nationals, those figures have probably moved up and the share of wage spending and total spending and the GDP has probably crept up further. Um, now, that creates a number of incentives for nationals all across the GCC, one of them being to seek public employment instead of private employment because it's more secure, it's less effort, 
uh, usually the wages are higher, they're higher on all levels of education compared to the private sector, and they don't have to compete with expatriates who are willing to work harder and with much lower reservation wages. So that through those most recent measures, they've pushed even further out of uh, the private labor market, where arguably in the long run, they have to find gainful employment because patronage uh, employment is not sustainable forever because demographies, uh, uh, populations are growing. Um, and uh, the, the salary uh, quota is already, on, on, already now on an unsustainable level uh, <clears throat> in terms of the fiscal sustainability of, of those systems. Uh, that's just another measure of uh, the, the, the consequences of uh, public sector patronage employment where you see that uh, the public sector is really dominated by nationals with, with the partial exceptions of Qatar and the UAE and the private sector in all countries is crushingly dominated by expatriates. So there's a, a real segmentation of employment. And to the extent that most gainful, productive employment is happening in uh, the private sector, nationals do not partake. They're, they're, not, they're not part of um, that uh, more productive aspect of the economy. So they're, they're part of the rent recycling process, but they're not very much part of, of the uh, production process in the economy. Um, same story, just with, uh, with figures only for Saudi Arabia, public, private, Saudi, non-Saudi employment, where you see that the private sector generates a lot more employment than the public sector, but it's dominated by expatriates, and it runs on much lower wages on average than the, uh, than the public sector. Um, another way of redistributing rents is uh, cheap energy, and that can happen through a variety of channels. One of them is just cheap gasoline, cheap diesel in particular, but also uh, other types of transport fuels, as well as cheap electricity and cheap water, which is generated through desalination processes, which are also very energy intensive. And you see here that the per capita consumption of uh, all the GCC countries is very high in international comparison. Uh, so big cars being driven around a lot, uh, and the prices are very low. So the, the, the incentives uh, are very closely correlated with, uh, with the consumption behavior, which is, which is something we should logically expect. It wasn't an issue uh, in the 1980s when there was a lot of spare capacity in the oil sectors and they didn't have a market to, ex to, to export their uh, oil products, so they might as well consume that domestically. Nowadays, the market is a lot tighter, the prices you get internationally are a lot higher, and domestic consumption is a lot larger. So a lot of uh, lost revenue is consumed domestically because uh, gas and oil are consumed at heavily subsidized prices, uh, often below even the production cost. Uh, <clears throat> and that eats into the fiscal sustainability of, uh, again, the, the national accounts of those countries. Uh, and it's becoming a bigger concern by the day to the extent that, that populations grow and per capita consumption still continues to grow. Um, now that's just gas prices. Uh, gas is used for uh, industrial purposes and petrochemicals and, and uh, other heavy industries. And of course, for uh, electricity generation, gas is made available very cheaply. You've got prices uh, consistently below $1 per um, million British thermal units, whereas a Western market price is somewhere four, five, six dollars. And that again gives an incentive for overconsumption. Uh, and you can, you can see that uh, the amount of gas of dry gas that is consumed within the GCC has been increasing quite dramatically over the last decade. So that is gas that's not available uh, for export to the extent that, it's, uh, that, that you could or would want to export it, but it's also not available for uh, industrial uses to the extent that it's just used for electricity generation. And all of the GCC countries, with the exception of Qatar, now have a gas shortage, which is quite, a, quite an interesting, quite paradoxical outcome. Here are the same figures for petroleum. Uh, where you see that in Saudi Arabia, two and a half million barrels per day are consumed domestically. Now, that's, that's more than is consumed in Germany, which is a country with three times the population of Saudi Arabia. Uh, and that, of course, eats into the export capacity. Everything they consume domestically is not sold internationally, so it's, it's lost revenue. Uh, just another unintended, at least originally unintended outcome of uh, the kinds of distribution structures they set up to subsidize their populations. Um, that weren't a big concern when populations were small and there was a lot of surplus capacity, but that, that are becoming a huge concern nowadays. Um, so current distributional systems keep nationals out of the economy because they're drawn into public employment instead of private employment. 
They don't have incentives to acquire education that would make them competitive on the private market because uh, for getting a public sector job, it's fairly irrelevant which kind of degree you have. The main thing is that you have a degree, you put yourself on the waiting list, and you get a, you, you get a job one day. So they're really being pushed out of the active uh, productive labor market. And in many cases, they act as intermediaries instead of entrepreneurs because they're given specific national privileges to invest in sectors where foreigners can't invest. But then, of course, foreigners are often the de facto investors and the nationals only act as, as frontmen. So it's another mechanism of distribution that arguably is, provides anti-entrepreneurial incentives. Um, the current distributional systems, they also distort consumption incentives. As I mentioned, overconsumption of petroleum, water, electricity, undermining the revenue basis of the GCC government. So Saudi Arabia's total energy demand in 2010 was about 3.4 million barrels of oil equivalent per day. They export around six to seven, so that's really a non-negligible quantity. And if current trends continue, they're going to be above 8 million uh, barrels of oil equivalent per day by 2028. And that's, uh, that's an official Saudi number from Aramco, from the national oil company. So they're very, very concerned about that. Um, because of uh, the, those greatly increased levels of spending on public employment and, and other patronage policies, break-even oil prices, so the oil price they need to have a balanced budget, have increased quite dramatically during the recent crisis. Uh, Saudi Arabia now is spending four times as much, uh, at least in nominal terms, as it did in the late 1990s. Uh, the Institute of International Finance uh, projects a break-even oil price of $110 per barrel for 2015. That's, that's quite high. I mean, if they get lower prices, it doesn't mean that they go bankrupt tomorrow because they have large reserves. But nonetheless, they could soon reach a, a level that is unsustainable in the long run unless prices continue to climb forever, which they won't. Uh, Bahrain probably has already reached that level somewhere above $100 per barrel because they have huge patronage spending uh, in the, the most recent budget, which was just ratified by, by Parliament. Uh, and <clears throat> the higher rent uh, per capita GCC countries, Kuwait, Qatar, UAE, they're a bit more comfortable, but they're in the long run on exactly the same trajectory, and they have even faster population growth in some cases than Saudi Arabia. So we don't know when it's going to prove unsustainable, but at some point it that the system, if it stays on the track where it is now, is going to become unsustainable. So just a variety of projections of what could happen to reserves, capital spending, current spending in Saudi Arabia under different oil price assumptions. We can perhaps go back through those uh, in the Q&A. The main point being if prices go down to $50 per barrel or below, then uh, they'll deplete the reserves quite quickly. Uh, if it's at 120 barrels per day, uh, on average, they're going to be quite comfortable for at least another decade, but even then, in the long run, reserves are going to be depleted. Um, all right, I got about three minutes left, and I'll, I'll try to make my more uh, less economical and more uh, political economy argument here, uh, and that's to understand the kinds of interests that are built into those uh, distribution systems. We've got to think a little bit about the fiscal sociology of Gulf countries. Uh, and we got to understand how they're different from tax-based states. Uh, and there, there's something uh, quite unattractive about state spending in rentier countries, because in a tax-based state, money that's spent by the government tends to stimulate the economy, thereby it stimulates, at the end of the day, uh, the, it, it enhances the revenue basis of the government. So that's uh, the, the idea of the balanced budget multiplier, which means that if you spend more at the end of the day, you'll also have a larger taxation basis. So you can kind of pull yourself up by your bootstraps to some extent. Now that doesn't work in rentier economies because you can spend however much you want. The money is going to disappear. It's going to stay with the private sector, with private consumers. It's not coming back to the government because there's no domestic taxation. Um, so in the, in the long run, more spending just depletes exhaustible state res, uh, uh, resources, and it doesn't do anything for uh, the revenue basis of the, uh, of the government. Uh, there's no fiscal feedback mechanism, as there's practically no taxation. There's also no employment mechanism in the sense that uh, st stimulatory spending would uh, generate additional employment for nationals, because most of the employment goes to foreigners. So everything that the government does that stimulates business growth are is in the interest of business, but not really in, in, in the interest of nationals, because there's no public services that are tax financed, and there's no employment that they could avail themselves of. There's an inherent tension then between patronage spending that the citizenry at large benefits from, and pro-growth, pro-business spending that only business um, that only business profits from. And that's just a schematic 
uh, sketch of how the fiscal sociology of a regular tax state works, where the government spends, stimulates the private sector, private sector creates jobs, pays taxes, from which the citizenry at the end of the day benefits opening uh, the opportunity for some kind of arrangement between citizens or voters and the private sector because they have a shared interest in economic prosperity. Now those two links don't work in, in rentier states because there are no taxes being paid, so there are no public services that are financed through income that's generated in the private economy. And the jobs that are created <coughs> by and large do go to foreigners, so citizens don't profit from that either. And that's why there's a juxtaposition of uh, fiscal policy interests between uh, the citizens and the private sector, that, that's a lot starker in rentier states than it is in regular tax-based states. Um, I just see my time has run out. Can I ask for two minutes? Excellent. Um, so I won't go into the solution very much. We can take them up in the, in the Q&A. I mean, it's kind of blue sky, policy-oriented thinking. Um, those are essentially the points that I, that I just made. Uh, there's, I'd just like to point out that there's one case where this kind of juxtaposition of business interest and the, the interests of, of voters, of the citizenry at large, is very stark, and that's in Kuwait, where voters systematically vote for very populist economic policies that are very bad for business, that are stifling private sector growth, but um, that is a result that doesn't concern citizens because the private sector doesn't pay taxes and they don't create jobs for nationals. So it's perfectly rational as a Kuwaiti voter to vote for very populist and very anti-growth economic policies. And that's exactly what's, what's been happening. Um, now, in other countries, there's less participation, so that kind of tension is less stark. But in the long run, I think that tension is going to emerge more strongly in those other cases, the more so that uh, fiscal resources are going to become more constrained, national employment is going to become a larger issue, and <coughs> there are going to be increasingly uh, large cohorts of young people seeking jobs and state services, so there'll be a rivalry in the resource use between uh, the private sector and the population. Um, private sector still depends on state spending, even if uh, the, 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 the de dependency is less immediate and is, is more longer term. So it, it still requires the state uh, for economic stimulation. Uh, and given that kind of bleak picture and those tensions, those inbuilt tensions in the fiscal sociology of oil-rich states, is there a way of distributing the money without creating those perverse incentives, uh, without destroying in the long run the fiscal basis of the state, uh, without pushing the citizenry out of the private sector and, and productive economic activities, and uh, that are designed in a way that the citizenry and business at least share some basic interest in, in economic development. Uh, and I think there are a number of, of uh, ways that could be done. I've run out of time, but one idea, which I very briefly will, will outline in, in 10 seconds, is that if instead of using the public sector as a job distribution tool, everyone in society was given a, a, a smaller but firmly guaranteed citizen's income, that would mean that the government could slim down the public sector, as everyone would have basic, uh, basic income maintenance guarantee. People would be less oriented towards public sector employment because they couldn't expect that guaranteed employment anymore. Uh, and at the same time, through the citizen's income, they would have a kind of top-up uh, income that they could combine with lower private sector incomes that would push them into the private market. So that would be a, a, a less distortionary and also a much juster system, because currently some people get public employment, others don't, and it's, it's fairly discretionary. Um, and there's some maths about how much that kind of system would cost. I mean, nothing of that is going to happen in the short run, but I think there's an emerging debate and uh, an emerging awareness of the unsustainability of public employment and of, more generally, uh, utility uh, and public service subsidization policies. So some of this is slowly emerging, even in the policy debate among technocrats in the region. I think it's a very interesting space to watch. There are a couple of other ideas on how to re-engineer distribution, but I think we should better take those up in the q and I've gone over three minutes and 37 seconds, for which I apologize, but I look forward to your questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, the next speaker we have is uh, James Redman. <coughs> James just flew 20 hours from Utah. He's done research in the University of Utah anthropology. Uh, looking at the system and the, Im the impact and advantage of working the system in a rentier state. 
and his example is in Kuwait. And his title is The Dynamics of Distribution in the Gulf, the Impact of Selective Allocation of Agency and Bureaucratic Accessibility in Kuwait. Thank you. Since 1946, the year that the Kuwait oil company began exporting its first barrels from the Bergen fields, it's become increasingly difficult to overstate the processes of change that have accompanied the influx of such incredible amounts of cash generated by such minimal productive output. Departing from its mercantile past, the time during which the merchants supplied the funds that underwrote all shakely ambitions and territorial aspirations, Kuwait emerged as an international supplier of natural resources. This new paradigm found the ruling al-Sabah situated atop the pinnacle of the nation's petrodollars, albeit without a solid legitimizing foundation. In response to this shortcoming, the regime, like its neighboring petrostates, fashioned itself into the country's paramount benefactor, a benevolent arch distributor charged with providing job security within its labyrinthine bureaucracy in conjunction with social welfare and, and an overall modernizing ideology that served to solidify the government's role as the citizen's guarantor. Similarly, Kuwait's external relations have also been tempered by its access to immense oil reserves lying beneath the sands. Essentially, the government's approach to its foreign policy has mirrored its tactics for internal stability. That is, the creation, through the mechanisms of distribution, of various clientels to mobilize an international constituency of supporters of Kuwait by creating foreign aid dependencies that, even if not outright supportive of the al-Sabah, would be pragmatically inclined not to want to see the source of so much revenue fall into anyone else's hands. The product of this mode of governments is the implicit understanding on the part of the populace that dissent and opposition can be assuaged not through coercion and martial punishment, but by entitlements and privileges. Superficially, this portrait of Kuwait lends itself well to that of a classical case of runtierism in that the country, like any number of states both within and outside of the Middle East, derives its revenue from sources that are external, accrued directly by the government, and are substantial enough to dwarf any local productive capacities in a way that engenders governmental spending and investment within its own sectors without the hindrances of public accountability since the citizenry is effectively excluded from the generation of state wealth. Yet this quick adoption of the frontier model perverts it through gross generalizations, assumptions, and inappropriate applications that range from basic economic determinism without any socio-political context to broad classifications of universal frontier ethics that brazenly dismiss the realities of local, historically specific circumstances. The most obvious of these faults is the fact that not all frontier states were created equal, and there are considerable disparities between them. Aside from the innumerable contextual variations, demographic factors arise as the most noticeable variable. States like Kuwait, with small populations, have been set aside as ideal types of frontierism due to the excessive impact of external rents on the national economy, coupled with the negligible existence of any secondary wealth-generating activities, a dynamic that amplifies the effectiveness of governmental distributive efforts. Also, ideological dispositions rooted in a range of socio-political and historical experiences prompted rent recipients to invest their revenues differently, which results in a range of possibilities when it comes to the configurations of frontier states. There are broad-based collective measures, but concurrent with these communal programs, however, have been the specific government distributions focused on sectarian and class distinctions. In this manner, the ruling elites can privilege certain sectors and certain companies within sectors through the letting of state contracts, control over access to capital, policies on the import of labor, and on the writing of governmental regulations. Since these and all other allotments are viewed quite literally as public resources that are gifts from God with resultant revenues devoid of well-developed policymaking or sizable local monetary outlay, their inequitable distribution calls into question the image of the regime's benevolence in the eyes of its citizenry. In Kuwait, there have been a number of high-profile transactions that expose the ruling family to accusations of malfeasance with the public treasury. The first case was the land purchase program of the late 1950s and early 1960s, which was little more than a thinly veiled reallocation of state funds to private accounts under the pretext of urban development. This actually rewarded the wealthy to provoke their loyalty and gratitude by reinforcing the pre 
oil dominance of the mercantile elites and their tribal counterparts in local dealings. Two decades after the start of the land purchase program, the government was again afforded several opportunities to funnel its state monies into private pockets when, in 1977, the prices of shares on the Kuwait Stock Exchange collapsed due to pervasive speculation and a preponderance of post-dated checks. The government swiftly stepped in and compensated traders for their losses with a bailout of over uh, KD 150 million, a little over 500, mil 500 million US. And this saved hundreds of merchants from bankruptcy, but ordinary Kuwaitis were left watching. Only a few years later, the average citizen would have a chance to venture into the market under the illusion that the government had already shown that it would not allow for a financial catastrophe, self-induced or not, to cripple its populace. Since the official exchange remained limited to the old families, a parallel market absent of any regulatory oversight arose in the El Manak building where fictitious Gulf companies that existed only on paper were bought and sold with post-dated checks or traded for real assets. But the euphoria was short-lived after one of Almanac's largest traders was found to be insolvent and the market crashed. The government's inclusion of the elite-dominated Kuwait Chamber of Commerce and Industry to remedy the fallout allowed the KCCI merchants to regain some of their hold over the country's policies that they had lost in the post-oil years after the state replaced them as the nation's employer and welfare provider. The last serious disruption to this implicit business-as-usual domestic rule commenced in the early hours of August 2, 1990, as Iraqi units poured over the border into Kuwait. Once safely in Saudi Arabia, the exiled government quickly moved to prepare the groundwork for its return. Politically, it appeased the opposition by pledging to restore the Constitution and reinstate the National Assembly upon liberation. On the other hand, more pressing was the issue of how to reestablish the relations that endorsed the status quo for so long. It had to reaffirm its own pre-war function as the nation's unrivaled distributor, despite the fact that the invasion had erased its capital surplus and driven the regime to seek loans. Accordingly, the government announced it would pay all existing loans and mortgages to Kuwaitis, pay back salaries to government employees, increase government entitlements in a variety of categories, and it also granted a 25% public sector salary increase, and it bailed out the ailing banking sector. Supplementing this general welfare package for the populace were several initiatives intended to rescue and mollify the nation's commercial establishment. Also in the rush to rebuild the country, the government oversaw modifications to its existing trade policies that appealed directly to the old family's interests. For example, the annulment of Public Tenders Law 37 lowered many of the barriers between contractors and public monies, particularly the prohibition on direct negotiation for tendering that bypassed the Central Tender Committee's powers of review that were in place to control the use of government money, providing ample enticements for businessmen to take part in the rebuilding efforts now that they could operate unimpeded by procedural supervision. Noticeably, these samples are quite illustrative of selective allocation on the part of the Kuwaiti government. Although there are wide-ranging perks that impact the citizenry, particular support is directed towards specific groups like the old merchant families and the tribes in the hopes of securing their political cooperation. This foregoing scenario is the basis for conventional frontier analysis, the local distribution of externally derived rent in exchange for popular popular obedience towards the state, yet this also pinpoints exactly why the frontier approach demands further treatment. The unequal disbursement of payments and privileges, rather than breeding passivity and contentment, actually cultivates resentment and discord. Hence, while the frontier framework is suggestive of the state's immunity from its citizenry's appeals, it cannot assume or guarantee the public's quiescence when the official distributive mechanisms are so skewed in the favor of so few. Another limitation readily apparent in frontier assessments is an overemphasis on a top-down dynamic that leads to assumptions about frontierism's effects on individuals without actually exploring the options available for individual agency. In small states like Kuwait with expansive bureaucracies that employ all but a fraction of the nationalized population, nearly everyone enjoys some sort of privileged access to the state and its resources. From ubiquitous civil servants to mid-level technocrats who there are seemingly endless ranks of intermediaries standing between citizens and services. 
With so many opportunities for influence peddling, proper channels and efficiency are either unforthcoming or altogether absent without personal intervention. Such traits lead to closed distribution systems that are closed particularly in terms of information. Whereas privileges are common knowledge, there's no open information about the criteria for entitlement, services, and rations. Combined with the absence of administrative impartiality at any level of government, from the routine daily offices for licenses and permits to the more specialized requests that require higher ranking intervention, it becomes a regular expectation that informal and personalized connections must constantly be sought to mediate transactions between the citizen and the state. This whole process of deploying one's contacts in order to make some desired result come to fruition requires the discriminative use of WASTA, or influential liaisons, to secure some benefits that otherwise might not have been reasonably attainable. And this defines those junctures where the interests of the state, the polity, and the body politic all intersect in a social climate where mutual favor doing is simultaneously a marker of success and a community expectation when any boundaries that would delineate individual concerns from the business of statecraft and industry are either unclear or completely negotiable. Further blurring any structural lines that would demarcate where the webs of informality end and the offices of state begin in Kuwait are the institutions situated between these two poles, the Diwaniya guest rooms or reception halls. Here, Wasta and Deza can be effectively managed and institutionalized as relational indexes that collapse the dichotomies of executive duties and customary commitments. This is not an unknown practice for lobbyists who must turn to those MPs who operate what are disparagingly called service diwania or simply services, khudamat, due to their use of state favors to ingratiate their support bases, though more frequently appeals heard in the Dawawin are cast in the likes of secondary and tertiary intermediaries who are strategically situated in a position to negotiate the terms of governmental privileges, even though the participating actors might actually regard themselves as being equivalents in status. Without question, Kuwait is not alone on its reliance on interpersonal associations to navigate its lethargic bureaucracy. In fact, a redistributive welfare economy like that found in Kuwait bears a striking likeness to the allocative monopolies that typify command markets. Most illustrative of this overlap is the lopsided public employment sector in Kuwait in concurrence with the government being in a position to inundate its nationals with services, subsidies, and favorable business opportunities. Furthermore, attempts towards increased privatization have been staunchly opposed on the grounds that it would seriously undercut the massive dispensational benefits that so many Kuwaitis have grown accustomed to receiving and, it can be supposed, the intercessional capacities of well-placed intermediaries who provide these allowances. This is the point that is key to understanding the existence of brokerage between state and society in Kuwait. It's top-heavy, unnavigable bureaucracy lends itself to an abundance of go-betweens who possess insider knowledge of how to satisfy most demands. However, the state's absolute control over the local economy must be included in any formulations of the parameters of Kuwait's WASTA-type intermediation. What this means is that instead of subjecting one's own assets to petitioners, it's actually the government's resources that are already destined for eventual redistribution that are being sought through the mobilization of these informal relationships. The only personal outlay is accessibility. Plus, these state properties are widely looked at as belonging to the citizenry, despite the difficulties that come with trying to receive these resources through formal measures without the right personal backing. In this frontier state society framework, WASTA and its in institutional manifestation in the Kuwaiti Diwaniya afford individuals opportunities of access in an environment that is rife with patronage, public sector uh, overemployment, and generous government disbursements, a realization that strikingly contrasts with any notions of frontier social dormancy. So to wrap up, I want to borrow the conclusion that was drawn by Anton Bloch in his closing remarks when he studied the transformation of regional power brokers in the wake of state centralization in Western Sicily. And I like what he said here because it's entirely applicable to Kuwait in a modern setting. And that is that he said that, quote, access to state resources is what counts today. Without it, 
local re resources would be inconsequential. And as I said, I believe that applies to Kuwait today. Thank you. Thanks, James. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Mark Valerie, and he's going to vary uh, his discussion into economic diversification and privatization. And the theme he addresses is state business relations in the GCC, the role of business actors and the decision-making process of reform. His recent book is uh, just out, and it's called Oman, Politics and Society in the Kabul State. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Debates over the necessity to rethink uh, the economic model of development based on oil rent are not new in the GCC. Uh, as uh, early diversification plans and nationalization policies um, of employment can testify. But they have taken a completely different dimension for the last 10 years. This had, has had major implications for the whole social contract in those countries and especially, and that's the focus on my uh, paper today, for the sociology of business and the relationship between the business sector and the political authority. In this perspective, this paper will adopt a comparative perspective. I will first talk about, um, very briefly, about the relationship uh, between uh, the business elite and uh, the political elite in the, GCC, in the five small uh, GCC states. So the, the GCC accepts, accepts Saudi Arabia. Then the second part of this presentation will focus on the compared impact of the business elite um, in affecting the orientations and the outcomes uh, of the reforms implemented in two countries due to time constraints. I will only talk about Bahrain and Oman. Uh, and I will especially take the, the example of the labor market reforms that have been implemented in these two countries for the last 10 years. Um, Jill Crystal explained that the development of oil production in Kuwait and, and Qatar has led to the withdrawal uh, from political life of the merchants, the group which historically presses uh, its claims on the state. We know about that. Uh, a, tac a tacit arrangement uh, between the rulers and the trading families have uh, occurred, a trade of wealth uh, for formal power. The merchants renounced their historical claim to participate in decision making, in exchange, the rulers granted them a large share, a large share of oil revenues. Um, never were the Omani business elite forced to choose money over formal political influence. This can be explained by um, Sultan Qaboos' extreme vulnerability when he accessed the throne. Sultan Qaboos had no other choice than giving than giving guarantees to merchant network ensuring them the protection of the political authorities, is not his personal and his family's, uh, his ruling family's personal uh, non-interference in the business sphere, and their privileged access to the oil through public contracts. So the privileged access of uh, the business elite uh, to the oil through public contracts. Kabus has thus granted strategic positions to the merchants to secure political contracts and control over the distribution of oil wealth. In Bahrain, the background of the business state relationship is quite different. Never in the 20th century did the ruling family feel legitimate enough to be able to assert their social and political control without the support of the business elite. Two main reasons justify this weakness. First, uh, never the ruling family did enjoy a rent sufficient enough to grant them a complete autonomy from the business elite support, as it has been the case in Qatar, for instance. Secondly, the sectarian division led or has led to a substantial um, or has led a substantial part of the, uh, majori the majority Shia population, especially since the 70s, to consider the ruling family as uh, possibly some, uh, sometimes Ill illegitimate. Even if a number of Baharna, that is Shi Arab uh, merchant families, are historical allies to the Al Khalifa, the traditional business elite is mainly composed of 
uh, Sunni families, either of Najdi background or Hawala, that is Sunnis uh, that migrated to Bahrain since the 19th century from the Iranian coast. In Bahrain, the, the sovereignty ministries are uh, the most sensitive ones, are monopolized by the Al Khalifa, can, and this cannot be compared to, with the situation in Oman, where only two members of the, ruling, the cabinet belong to the Al Said ruling family, uh, but where businessmen held uh, or has held prominent decision making position or held prominent business uh, decision making, uh, sorry, uh, prominent decision making positions until last March. In the UAE, given the entire ruling coalition and that the pattern of political control remain relatively unchanged, the business actors remain firmly, firmly outside the highest level of decision-making process. Of course, some businessmen hold uh, cabinet positions at the federal, federal or at the Emirates level, uh, but this cannot be compared at all with what we can see in uh, Oman or in Kuwait. So, I don't want to be um, um, st uh, to give you a very static perspective or a very essentialist perspective, not at all, but uh, because this has evolved with time, especially since the 70s. But uh, we can then establish a kind of scale describing the relationship between the ruling family and the business elite in these five countries. And one extreme we can position Oman, where Said bin Taymor uh, and then Qabus bin Said uh, have never relied politically on their own poli uh, ruling f or their own family. So they had uh, to grant, or they have had to grant the business elite positions, in the, uh, the business elite some positions uh, and very important decision making positions is in the cabinet. Then we have Kuwait, where with merchant families and the ruling family, which are broadly from the same social background, where they have, um, the merchant families have been uh, in position of strength and in capacity to negotiate with the ruling family at many occasions during this story, and in time of crisis especially to prevent the intrusion of new economic actors, uh, challengers to, them, to their uh, business positions. Even some business families have traditionally produced politicians like until now al Khorafi family or al Hanim. Um, in Bahrain then, um, the legitimacy of the Al Khalifa is certainly the, was, the one most subject to be challenged. They have a room of, but they have a room of maneuver, of maneuver towards the merchants because these merchants also consider themselves as a minority and because most of them are socially disconnected from the population. Their influence is not based on social networks. Uh, but the ruling family cannot totally uh, align the support of the merchants who embody the most important element of their legitimacy with the Sunni tribes which are fueling positions in the army and in the intelligence. Then we have UAE and Qatar, where the business actors remain firmly outside the highest level of the decision-making process, where members of the ruling family are the most powerful business actors, uh, and especially in Qatar, where virtually all economy uh, is controlled by the Athani, uh, the Athani and some very close non-merchant families. So, I will start my second part, uh, the second part of my paper by concentrating on Bahrain and Oman and on the labor market reforms there. I'll concentrate um, on these countries with, an with my, the following argument. My argument is that internal uh, political, pol uh, sorry, internal power politics within the ruling elite in Bahrain and Oman has a decisive impact on how the reforms have been implemented for the last 10 years. More precisely, one key variable for me is the degree of proximity independence of the business elite vis-a-vis -vis the ruling elite or the ruling family. In Oman, the sixth and the seventh five-year plans, that is the, uh, the sixth one was between 2001 and 2005 and the seventh five-year five plan uh, between 2006 and 2010, I have emphasized drastically on the scope of economic diversification by working simultane simultaneously on the development of the gas sector, on tourism, on, on non-oil industries. And this diversification policies were supported by a strong desire to promote the private sector as the main contributor of growth. In Bahrain, 
Um, the accession to the throne of Sheikh Hamad uh, in 1999 marked the beginning of a series of political and economic reforms intended to renew the social cohesion in order to strengthen the legitimacy of the Al Khalifa family. In the economic sector, uh, Sheikh Hamad uh, declared his intention, his intention to adopt a more interventionist approach to decision making. As you know, an economic development board was created chaired by the Crown Prince uh, Sheikh Salman. Um, a royal decree in 2005 transferred the national economy element of the Ministry of Finance and National Economy to the Economic Development Board. The Ministry of National Economy itself was dissolved and the ADB, the Economic De uh, Development Board, was given the overall responsibility for outlining, proposing and managing the economic reforms of Bahrain according to the model of Singapore Economic Development Board. This extended mission included uh, the promotion of private sector growth and investment, the implementation of a comprehensive labor market reform program, and the diversification of economy away from oil, given that almost nothing had been done since the, the 80s in terms of diversification in Bahrain. In Oman, the labor market reforms have been decided and organized at the top of the regime, given that it has been considered as a national challenge. According to the new labor law, for instance, in 2003, the employer get the permits from the Ministry of Manpower to bring forward um, foreign workers only if there are not enough Omanis available for the post on the job market, and if the company has complied with the prescribed percentage of immunization in its branch. The major business families who control the Chamber of Commerce and Industry were um, decisively positioned to express that uh, disagreement with the labor market policy implemented, considering that these policies were deterring, uh, deteriorating their competi competitiveness. And thus, they advocated uh, changes f um, of long-term policy. But what is partly interesting in Oman is that there has been, and there is, a conflict of interest, a substantial conflict of interest between political and economic decision-making elite. These persons are the same who are holding the cabinet positions that are deciding the national challenges of humanization, and at the same time, they control the most important business sector or the business, most important business companies that are against these policies or that are uh, considering that these policies are not working well for the country. So, after two or three years of uh, growing um, concern and a growing, sorry, um, 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 stress on this uh, diversific uh, on this uh, harmonization policies, a major change happened around 2005, 2006, um, with harmonization requirements were really were substantially relaxed if not officially, but um, at least practically. And uh, I will quote a member of the Majlis Ashura who explains that um, until 2005, the government pushed the private sector to hire Omanis. It looked like forcing. With time, the government analyzed that, that, was done, that what was done was wrong. Omanization is not a replacement process. It is necessary to ask instead how to appoint more Omanis, but we will always need expatriates. The Omani authorities are focused on economic liberalization by giving prominence to a strong, stronger role for private capital, um, even if it means the emergence of inflation and acceptance of a kind of pause in the Omanization policy of employment. As a consequence, this change of, of policy since 2005-2006 has uh, led to a change of the humanization rate in the private sector from, uh, that decreased from 19%, 1919, 19% at the end of 2005 to less than 15% in March 2011, given that the number of active expatriates has more than doubled uh, within four and a half years' time. From this point of view, policies of privatization and harmonization of private sector jobs are reliable indicators for me of the role of the business actors in the decision-making policy.
the priority granted to the private sector since 2005 and to investment in major projects to the detriment of openly claimed objectives like harmonization of employment and control of immigration of workers are a clear indicator on which side the balance has been tilting for four to five years now. In Bahrain too, I have only one minute, but I will try to, to, to be quick. In Bahrain too, the labor market reform has been thought out from above um, as a key element of the new king's strategy of leg legitimization. But um, um, this policy gradu uh, included gradually uh, phasing out of the Bahrainization quotas, but allowing easier termination procedures of Bahrainese employees and replacing them with a fee-based system under which employers pay a 75 uh, Bahraini dinar monthly fee per expatriate worker and a 600 Bahraini dinar visa issuing and renewing fee per worker for each two-year period in order to bring the cost of local and expatriate labor force in line. This has led to very strong uh, debates among the, ruling family, no, among the ruling family, not to say more. Um, the Crown Prince, was, uh, who, who is leading the, the Economic Development Board, was in favor of this policy and was uh, pushing for this policy. On the contrary, the Prime Minister, the, the uncle of the King, who, was very, who is very close to most important business sector and business companies, were a kind of advocate of uh, another policy. And the king was very clear in giving uh, the support, his support to his son, that is to this uh, policy implemented by the Economic Development Board. The king arbitrated without ambiguity of, or in favor of his son. Since then, the EDB, the Economic Development Board, has been granted an almost decisional independence, is not accountable to any other body in the country, nor to the cabinet, uh, neither to the cabinet nor to the chambers, and the private sector has been forced to adapt once again to this changing balance of power. Until now, um, this, there are a lot of uh, debates about that in Bahrain. Um, that led to, for instance, to public demonstrations of businessmen, recurrent appeal to leading figures of the royal family, and tight negotiations on the concrete implementation of the legislation. That is not um, uh, believe, um, um, conceivable in Oman. Um, the Sultan has never been able to prevent the merchant families from taking political position and actively participating, if not determining, the decision of economic orientations. Um, I want to conclude by one word, I, I had two words, but one was developed by Stefan, so I will not come back on that. Um, I want just to mention that, um, I want to put this in perspective with the protests that have been taking place uh, in the JCC since January. It's very interesting to notice that the business sector, except some isolated cases, have constantly reasserted their proximity with the regimes, and reasserted the necessity to preserve the stability of the country. Words meaning that uh, they considered the protesters as more troublemakers than bearers or legitimate demands. They have not even shyly associated with their voice to some of the protesters' demand, except, in very, except with some exceptions like Faisal Jawad, for instance, in Bahrain, but these are really exceptional. Um, for instance, the Bahrain Chamber of Commerce has called for a complete boycott of trade two weeks ago with Iran to protest against Tehran's alleged fueling of our unrest in Bahrain. And the, uh, the Bahrain Chamber of Commerce and Industry uh, Treasurer Othman Sharif said that the decision was taken in solidarity with Bahrain leadership. Even more than that, in Bahrain and in Oman, one of the main targets of the protesters uh, was the business elite accused of corruption, unwarranted privileges, and political and economic opposition to change. In, in Oman, then, uh, in March, a major cabinet reshuffle happened that led to the, uh, the firing of two of the most important uh, ministers, the Minister of National Economy and the Minister of Commerce and Industry, that are two very important businessmen, uh, uh, person belonging to business families. That, uh, that is a crucial question to me for Oman given that 
one of the key legitimacy, key for legitimacy of Sultan Qaboos was and has been uh, the business elite and the mis business elite, what will be the consequences for his legitimacy, for his sta the stability of, of his country, let's say, if he goes too far in punishing the business elite in order to uh, uh, create some, uh, to appease the, the protest that are uh, growing and that are uh, at the moment still. I thank you very much for your attention. Our fourth panelist is Dr. Jayardhan. He's resident in Dubai. He's a well-known political analyst, and he takes the lid off all these and look at sustainability, free enterprise, and the link between academia and industry. His theme is towards sustainable growth, the economic diversification, knowledge economy link. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Middle East uh, Institute and uh, National University of Singapore for the invitation. Let me start with an observation. For the first time, the GCC countries pursued and continue to pursue economic diversification during rather very high oil prices, unlike the tendency to do so when oil prices are low. Among the reasons could be long-standing pressure for, from international financial institutions to develop a non-oil economy. Second, consideration that oil may not last forever. Third, realization that since oil prices are likely to continue to remain high, it makes sense to conserve and prolong the longevity and value of their hydrocarbon resources, rather than pump more to meet growing developmental expenditure. Fourth, a new confidence that they can develop an efficient non-oil economy just like they did with an oil economy. And fifth, perhaps most importantly, as a result of the realization that this is the only way to tackle the unemployment among nationals. A few premises on which my presentation is based are, first, the region cannot continue to excessively depend on foreign labor in the long run, given the growing national unemployment problems which augurs badly for controlling extremism and ensuring political stability. Two, the number of nationals capable of managing and expanding economic diversification plans are way below the required level. Three, the shift from predominant reliance on expatriate labor to a more dependable national workforce in the new economy is possible only if the education sector is revamped. And finally, all this is not possible unless there is a change of mindset among nationals to study, train, and work in the private sector on its terms, and for the private sector to employ more nationals by taking up the responsibility of starting a process that will hold them in good stead in the long run. A word on the health of the GCC wealth. The collective GDP has crossed a trillion dollars, it's expected to touch 2.3 trillion, according to some estimates, by 2020. The combined external current account surplus stands at nearly 300 billion. Foreign assets are estimated to be worth about 1.7 trillion dollars. Foreign liabilities are limited to just 500 billion. And they have some of the world's biggest sovereign wealth funds. With so much, why then is there an emphasis on economic diversification? Like many other emerging countries, the GCC countries have also been bitten by the sustainable development mantra. They now believe that a sustainable economy enhances their standard of living by creating wealth and jobs, encouraging the development of, a new, knowledge and, of new knowledge and technology, and ensuring stability. In this, having a diversified economy is considered important. To facilitate the growth of the non-oil economy, projects worth more than 2.4 trillion are either planned or under construction in the region. Many of these are expected to be complete by 2017, including the Gulf Railway project, the first nuclear plant, and the regional electricity grid, among others. The UAE is a leading spender on infrastructure, followed by Saudi Arabia, and collectively between 2002 and 2008, 
the GCC governments awarded about $720 billion worth of infrastructure projects, a trend that has picked up over the last two years, and we'll see more momentum in this in the future. The impact of lower oil prices was evident when Saudi Arabia's gross domestic income from oil production fell to 46.7% from 60.7% in 2009 compared to 2008. This was partly offset by an increase of 5% in the contribution of the non-oil sector to the GDP. The private sector's contribution to the GDP also rose from 24% to 32% during the same period. In another example, the non-oil sector's contribution to the UAE's GDP in 2010 was 71%. Similarly, Qatar has earmarked 50% of its investments into non-oil sectors, including about 100 billion on 2022 World Cup projects. Doha has also said that it aims to reduce its economic reliance on hydrocarbons to zero by 2020. Talking about football, it's interesting to note that sports, tourism, airlines, and hospitality industries are part of the diversification plan. Why? Even interest in the high-tech chip industry is right up there. The most ironical diversification sector is, of course, the renewable energy sector, where in Abu Dhabi is now the headquarters of the International Renewable Energy Agency. And less said, the better about Dubai, which is famous as a city of several cities, Internet city, media city, sports city, healthcare city, academic city, among others. It is perhaps these, among others again, that have enabled it to remain a vibrant city and not a ghost town, as one Western journalist had portrayed it after 2009 financial crisis. It is obvious that the GCC countries have learned a lesson after squandering oil wealth during the 1970s. Thus, like I said at the start, for the first time, high oil price is accompanied by economic diversification. Economic reform is also encouraging private sector growth, which, in turn, is capable of providing competitive and underprivileged nationals with opportunities to take up challenging jobs rather than just rely on the public sector. How does the education scenario fit in here? While some of the GCC countries have the world's best indicators for economic growth, they also have the worst outcomes in the educational sector. The key question is, why is the education system still rudimentary while the country has made rapid economic strides? In 2007, when the last TIMS exam, the Trends in International Mathematics and Science study was held, the results were very discouraging, as it was in 2003. Qatar was last among the GCC countries, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait were only placed ahead of Qatar, and Dubai, which was the only emirate which took the exam in 2007, was the best in the region, placed 27. Such education has resulted in a scenario that is akin to a ticking time bomb. The old oil economy helped create the current wealth, but the development of the new economy that is being attempted requires the bulging youth population to be adequately skilled and employed not only for economic reasons, but for social reasons too, and now political as well. The GCC government's expenditure on education was expected to create a generation of skilled nationals who would become part of a larger local workforce, but that hasn't happened. For example, with Saudi Arabia's population expected to reach nearly 50 million by 2025, unemployment and its impact is indeed a priority concern. A World Bank report on the Middle East and North African labor markets estimated that 100 million jobs would have to be created by 2030. The challenge, however, would not be to fill 100 million jobs, but to find 100 million employable candidates. The GCC countries, and specifically, need to create 4 million jobs in the next 20 years. While private companies will need to create the majority of these jobs, they are producing only about 82,000 jobs per year for GCC nationals. To bridge the gap, the private sector will nearly have to create jobs at four times the rate that they are doing now and pay twice as much for each of these jobs. To put it into Microsoft language, the region needs to upgrade its software from Gulf 1.0 to Gulf 2.0. In Gulf 1.0, private companies, expatriates, and Private companies, expatriates, and Gulf nationals worked in the public sector. In Gulf 
Locals will have to play a greater role in the private sector, which some refer to as being under beta testing in some places. Again, in Gulf 2.0, the GCC countries must move from labor-intensive fields to capital and knowledge-intensive fields. To accomplish this, the region would have to revamp its educational system and find a way for small and medium enterprises to get more capital. Hence, the emphasis on knowledge economy. The 1999 World Development Report said, for countries in the vanguard of the world economy, the balance between knowledge and resources has shifted so far towards the former that knowledge has become perhaps the most important factor determining the standard of living. More than tools, land, and labor, today's technologically advanced economies are truly knowledge-based. This premise rests on breaking away from the neoclassical economics model, which recognized only two factors of production, labor and capital, for over two centuries. Instead, new growth theories stress on a third dynamic, technology where knowledge is seen as increasing the return on investment. Taking a cue from this, the GCC countries are attempting to tread the knowledge economy route, one in which the generation and exploitation of knowledge play the predominant part in the creation of wealth, where human capital is the chief source of economic value and education and training the main tools. But the GCC countries lack either adequate numbers of indigenous population or the necessary skills to ensure continuity in the core management of every enterprise that is put up. And since we are in Singapore, I just want to narrate what uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew had to tell a group of uh, young Arab and Asian scholars who were uh, visiting Singapore about four years ago, including me. He gave the Christmas tree analogy. He said, if you look at a Christmas tree uh, in Singapore, the locals represent the main part of the tree with expatriates merely being the decorative pieces on it. You take away the decorative pieces and the tree can still stand alone, looking beautiful and able to manage the Singaporean economy. Put the same thing in the Gulf. The main tree is represented by the expatriates with the decorations from the locals. Take away the expatriates and you have nothing left of the tree even if the decorations remain. How do you remedy this? Again, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew suggested ed education reforms starting with English language, and he was being very specific to the Gulf region. He attributed Singapore's success to education in the English medium. And he said at the time they were putting together their first cabinet and their first reform agenda, the debate was about which language to adopt in this country. Were they to go about pushing for English, it would have meant that they could have been a social crisis. People would have revolted. They let the market then decide who gets the best jobs. It seemed that for the first few years, people with English language, with better English language skills, got the better jobs, whereas those with Chinese language skills got you know, poorly paid jobs. Over a period of time, people decided to move on to the English language, and he says that Singapore is better connected with the world today than you know, many other parts of the world, including the Gulf. Uh, as if it was a case of better late than never, Saudi Arabia has now decided to teach English in government schools from grade four, effective 2011-2012, advancing it from grade six, which was started in about 2003. And starting last year, even three and four-year-olds at government kindergartens across Abu Dhabi are being introduced to bilingual teaching. As much, of this, uh, as much as this dilutes the call of those calling for reinforcing national identity in the Gulf, the emphasis on education makes sense because just to give you an example, in the UAE, the Ministry of Higher Education spends 30% of the university education budget on remedial English courses. Further, as part of the education reforms, the GCC policymakers are raising their sights by introducing various education reforms by studying the successes and failures of education reforms elsewhere, and by partnering with some of the world's leading educational institutions to apply those lessons, the region is attempting to create a unique laboratory for educational innovation. Education reforms have varied across the region. While the UAE and Qatar have focused their energies on developing private universities, Saudi Arabia is focusing on strengthening public universities. However, all the GCC countries are revamping their school systems. Again, for the first time in their history, the GCC countries are setting aside more money for education 
than for arms. The UAE and Saudi Arabia alone are planning to spend more than 30 billion on projects to close the knowledge gap with the West, which is much more than the 20 billion US arms sales plan for the GCC countries that was under discussion in mid 2007. This shows how the GCC countries are emphasizing on knowledge software and not just military hardware. Apart from school-based reforms that are targeting teachers and students, there are efforts to tie up with foreign institutions at the higher education level. Qatar, UAE, and Saudi Arabia have plenty of examples of such partnership. And in a classic case of linking economic diversification to knowledge economy, Qatar is even planning a high-speed rail link between Education City and Bahrain, which would make a one-way journey possible in just 50 minutes to woo Bahraini students. A few concluding remarks. For now, the GCC countries will continue to rely on expatriate workforce to keep, on, keep up the momentum of economic boom and hope that revamping the education sector and opening foreign institutions in the country will send the right signals for the new generations of citizens. It is the second stage that is critical. If GCC governments are serious about diversifying their economies away from oil, it is likely to happen only if it is done on the back of indigenous labor because expatriates cannot be expected to be just as committed to achieving a national objective as nationals would be in the long run. I would like to draw your attention to a Davos document in 2007, which outlined three scenarios for the future of the GCC countries until 2025. First, the optimistic scenario, or OASIS, where technocratic governments and reform pays off in the future and the regional economic models become less regulated and more integrated to the globalist ethos. The pessimistic scenario or sandstorm scenario, where political chaos in the Middle East spills over and domestic unrest sweeps the GCC countries, effectively ending any hope for social and economic development. And the third and most interesting, it's called the fertile gulf, where the GCC integrates into the world economy, where reform becomes inclusive, and innovation and knowledge, not mere extraction of oil and gas, defines regional economies. So, despite the uncertainties of the Arab Spring, I'm optimistic that it is likely to be a fertile gulf. Thank you. Thank you, Jana. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have about 10 minutes for question and answer. Yes, please. Hi, thank you. Uh, my question is for Dr. Jana Dhan. Uh, you, your talk was about the diversification of the economy, and I wanted you to elaborate in particular on how successful the renewable energy sector in the Gulf is. I mean, from what I've heard and read about Mazdar City in Abu Dhabi, for example, it is kind of like a playground for the rich. And although the city aims to rely entirely on solar energy and other renewable energy sources, it sounds like, and although, um, the, I mean, it is a good climate for solar energy, I've heard that they have like uh, problems like, um, because of the sandstorm, sand particles get stuck on the solar panels, which greatly decreases its efficiency. And so far, the state-of-the-art technology to combat it is for a man to manually wipe it with a cloth. And if you have huge solar panel fields, I mean, so thank you. Yeah, why are you going to take it? I'm really not much of a technical expert when it comes to renewable energy, but just as much sand could be a deterrent, I'm also told that sand is an important component of making solar panels. So, I mean, so there is a basic ingredient for them to move into that direction. But essentially, I mean, uh, one doesn't necessarily have to go by the example of Master. You know, Master was created at a time when Abu Dhabi was making its mark in a very competitive UAE, which had Dubai, you know, rising up. Uh, Dubai stock was really rising. So what they did then was, uh, you know, announce a very ambitious plan which didn't really uh, take off over a period of years now. I mean, so they've now revamped the whole thing and a master I think is going to be much more practical organization now and not exactly the way it was meant to be. I think it was 
meant to be a zero carbon city at one point. I don't know if it would be on the same scale as it was announced. It would be still a zero carbon city, but uh, on a much uh, smaller scale. But if I were to just give you an example of uh, what the, the UAE's commitment to renewable energy is as an example for the rest of the Gulf countries, I think uh, they are looking at roughly about uh, a, a renewable energy accounting for at least seven percent of Abu Dhabi's power generation capacity by 2020. And you would know that around the world, renewable energy is not something that is immediately going to make up for high oil prices or whatever. I mean, it's going to be a, a very small uh, you know, part of the overall mix. And uh, you will not see major changes happening in renewable energy. But the fact, the most interesting thing, and one needs to give credit to the Gulf countries, is that despite being uh, you know, owners of fossil fuel, they are venturing into renewable energy. Thank you. I'll take two questions and then we'll combine it. Uh, Dr. Lee and uh, Dr. Heath. Uh, I'd, I'd like to follow up that first question from the floor, which I think has a, has a germ of uh, an idea, um, both around the, the, the need for diversification of the economy brought up by the last uh, speaker, and also the unsustainability of the current uh, spending trend brought up by the first speaker. Um, because besides the investment in education, I mean, the other thing that was pointed out by Dr. Hertog was the great difference between current spending and capital spending. So that's another way of looking at what is the capital spending that is going into diversifying the economy. You could argue that education spending is part of it, but a lot of the capital spending is only going into infrastructure projects. And the question then is whether the renewables sector actually affords um, uh, an opportunity to develop a new industry sector Firstly, perhaps by uh, diverting some of the subsidies that are going into hydrocarbon consumption into subsidies for consumption of renewables, which we know are not competitive, but the additional subsidy that's required actually for renewables in the, in the, in the hydrocarbon uh, countries of, of the Middle East are actually proportionately less than in a free market uh, pricing of, of hydrocarbons. And longer term, perhaps developing these uh, uh, renewable energies, even potentially for wider export or where the intellectual property stays with uh, the developer in, in, in the Middle East. Secondly, it, it is a very natural uh, adjunct uh, when, when, you, when you are able to project uh, your, your importance in the world through sustained hydrocarbon manufacture, which, which is uh, part, I think, of the key foreign policy uh, power of countries in the Middle East, at least those who export. Um, by, by actually uh, bringing more renewable energies into the domestic consumption uh, equation. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Yeh. Yes, my name is uh, Martin Witt from Denmark, and uh, thank you for four very good presentations. And I have uh, one brief question, actually, for Stefan Hertog. And um, if I understood you correctly, uh, then you are not, you know, I understand and agree very much with you on uh, your issues on, on taxation, the benefits of taxing a population. But if I understood you correctly, you do not foresee that you could actually implement a taxation system in the GC, GCC countries. I would think that, you know, out of the many things these states has to do or you know, in an economic terms over the years, to implement a taxation system would not be the most difficult one. Uh, but I would like to hear your opinion on that. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, those are very useful questions. Um, I don't think that, that capital spending is currently threatened in any of the GCC countries apart from uh, Bahrain and Oman because they have very small resources and all the patronage um, items that have been rolled out in, in recent page, in, through recent decrees, they're already putting a pressure on, uh, on infrastructure outlays. Uh, in the other countries, there could in the long run be a crowding out effect, and there has been one in the, in the 80s, specifically in the 1990s, when in Saudi Arabia, subsidy and salary, public sector salary spending, was privileged over capital spending to the extent that they didn't even pave their roads anymore, and uh, public infrastructure had very badly deteriorated by 1999. So the first victim... Uh, in case of uh, you know, fiscal bottleneck is going to be capital spending with very deleterious not long-term consequences. The, the way they're using it now, uh, you're quite right, is, is uh, 
to a large extent infrastructure. Some of it goes into public enterprise, some of which is actually remarkably successful, surprisingly so. It's, it's a little bit uh, perhaps on, the, on even the, the Singapore model, with, uh, w which is a very, very liberal economy, but you have Tamasic, right? You have a, you have a, a state holding with very significant, um, with very significant state-controlled enterprises. Uh, and I mean, there are also white elephants, but by and large, it's been used more effectively for... State-linked enterprises. Yeah. <laughs> Government-related entities. Um, so uh, by and large, the kind of diversification successes uh, in the state sector have been more impressive than what's been happening in the private sector in terms of really breaking new ground into, into new uh, areas of activity. Um, and I would, I would agree that renewables make a lot of sense because right now the opportunity cost of burning diesel in domestic power plants are huge. Building, even at current cost structures, building solar panels uh, in the desert, even if they have to be wiped every three hours by very cheap labor, um, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, what makes even more sense economically, though, and I'm not sure that what happened in Japan recently is going to change that calculus, is nuclear power. Because it's extremely capital intensive, well capital no problem, they got a lot of overseas capital that they can't really use that they want to actually plow in productively into the local economy. Um, they're authoritarian systems so they don't have the kind of regulatory uh, political uh, hurdles that you have, have to go through in, in uh, more participatory uh, systems, they can just build it somewhere in the desert and, and uh, they can do it pretty quickly. Uh, and I think they're going to move there on a large scale. Uh, so there, there will be renewables in a strict sense, but I think uh, th the bulk of investment is probably for the time being going to go into nuclear. Um, regarding taxation, um, well, uh, administratively, introducing taxation I don't think would be impossible. Politically, it's proven systematically impossible. There have been repeated attempts in a number of GCC countries to create income taxes, to create sales taxes, VA VAT. They've been defeated resoundingly by, by private sector lobbying. And I don't think that's going to change unless there's a big, big bargain, a big quid pro quo between state and business. What they should, of course, ideally do is tax foreign labor because that would close the wage gap uh, and that would reduce the inflow of foreign labor and would again make uh, nationals more competitive. They're doing it in kind of a stealth way through visa fees and all kinds of other fees, but they haven't been able to push that very far, certainly not in the context of, of the most recent crisis. Okay, I'll take a twin question from uh, Pasha G and Dr. Anthony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Two points to Dr. Mark Valeri. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One is uh, Kuwait, the other one is Qatar. Uh, regarding Kuwait, uh, it's about political stability. How do you see the aggressive attitude of some of the merchant families who are represented in the National Assembly? you know, their confrontationist approach uh, over a period of time which led to dissolution of the National Assembly 70s, 80s, and uh, uh, the threat uh, looming uh, again. How do you see this as a confrontation between the Al-Sabahs and the non-royal merchant families? Of course, Jill Crystal had done work uh, quite some time back on Kuwait and uh, uh, Qatar, but I think things have changed lately in that direction. Regarding Qatar, you refer to the non Althani merchant families, although small by number, but do you think this small merchant class can spur uh, the call for political uh, reforms, you know, given uh, Sheikh Hamad's promise uh, to hold elections to the National Assembly for the last uh, couple of uh, years? Thank you. Uh, one short question, comment to Dr. Janardhan. You know, uh, you talked about sustainable um, uh, knowledge economy I mean, in all GCC countries, the women have been taking advantage of the education. How do you see you know, political reforms or political stability uh, in all of these, particularly in Saudi Arabia, given that uh, they have not been given enough role, yeah. uh, a social role also, uh, apart from political role? Thank you. Okay. Yes, Dr. Anthony. Can you pass the mic to... Rana, I promise this is the last question. Thank you. No one has um, addressed the issue of the economics of desalination technology. We've had this for 60 to 70 years, and yet the per unit cost never seemed to come down to a level of affordability or accessibility. Given the situation you have in Yemen, 
27 million people, no river, no stream, no brook, <laughs> no pond, no pool, no puddle, no rain. Uh, what are the economics of desalination here in terms of the GCC countries in its own interests, Oman would be another one, and also the looming demographic crisis next door in Yemen? Why is this not affordable? Why is it not expanding? Why are there no breakthroughs in Oman where there's the regional center for water research? Okay, Mark, we need to take it. Um, regarding Qatar first, um, I don't see the merchant families being a kind of uh, uh, leaders for political reform in, in the, the country. Uh, the Al Fardan family, for instance, or uh, other families, they will not be uh, the kind of promoters for political reforms like the merchant families in Kuwait in the 30s. No, uh, I don't see that happening. Uh, for Kuwait, that's why I didn't want to be too, uh, stat to give you a too statist perspective or too essentialist, because in Kuwait it has evolved many times. For instance, during the 70s, with the influx of oil revenues, uh, the Kuwait government and the Kuwait ruling family has tried to push to uh, favor new actors to enter the, the business sector and the economy in order to, to balance the influence of m old merchant families. But during the 80s and 90s, uh, the, during, of course, because of the, the fiscal crisis, they could not, the, the, the regime could not support this policy. And then the, the merchant families were again here to, to be, to, they were called again in order to support the economy. And then they were uh, the, the support for challengers uh, were decreased, decreased uh, substantially. At the moment, what we can see is interesting, is that with the oil boom, uh, uh, the oil prices boom, we notice that the, the, the Al Sabah uh, have um, entered much more the economy than it was before, than they, were, than they did before. Uh, that's very interesting because they are directly challenging the merchant families uh, during this time. They are not promoting any more new ch or challengers, but they are, they are themselves entering the, the market and the business sector or the, the, the economy in general. And that's very interesting. So uh, the, we can explain the way how the, the aggressive policy of the merchant families in Kuwait in the parliament in this perspective also as a way to, to defend themselves, them, their positions in the, the economy against the intrusion of the ruling family. Not only that, of course, but that's uh, part of the, the explanation. But one word on desalination. Uh, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say anything. Well, I it's, well it's very energy intensive. And because the opportunity cost yeah. of energy, of oil, gas, mm -hmm. imported coal, uh, which, whichever energy carrier have increased dramatically, it's, it's mm -hmm. becoming fiscally unsustainable. There's now talk of potential solar desalination, of nuclear desalination, but you do need a lot of energy. And as long as tariffs are very low, uh, per capita consumption is going to be very high, it's going to be very pricey, and it's, it's going to trend upwards because households become bigger, houses become bigger. So um, it's just part of the larger story of, of energy overconsumption. It's just uh, w one component, one wedge in, in, the, in the larger picture. Well, on that note, if we can continue our conversation after this, it uh, takes me to ask you to give a clap for my panel. Thank you.